There we go. All right, so welcome everyone and thank you all for joining uh, today's Preventing Youth Hate Crimes and Bullying web event, Overview of Criminal Extremist Hate Groups. My name is William Moore with OJJDP's INTAC. And before we begin, there's just a few items that I'm going to remind everyone about to keep in mind during today's web event. Please note that we are recording today's webinar. Please note that the webinar, uh, along with other webinars around juvenile justice and child victimization and prevention, are located on OJJDP's multimedia page and YouTube channel. If you would like to get the transcript or any supporting materials to any of those webinars, we encourage you to please reach out to the TTA Help Desk. If you're having trouble, trouble downloading any of the materials provided in the Google Drive link that my uh, colleague is putting in the chat there, um, please be sure to uh, follow up the OJJDP TTA Help Desk. For optimal audio, we are asking for folks to please use the Call Me At feature in WebEx. Once you are connected, to WebEx, you will see a headset or phone icon appear to next to your name. Please note that all individuals who are attendees for today's webinar have come in on mute. You will only hear uh, the WebEx host and our presenters and panelists for today. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties during the web event, please reach out to me and send a private chat and I'll be more than happy to assist you. During today's webinar, please note that we are encouraging folks to ask questions to our panelists and to our moderator. Um, to do so, you will select or click on the chat window. You will type in your message or your question. However, before you hit send, we are asking for you to go to the to field and make sure that it says all panelists there in the field. And then once you've confirmed that it says all panelists, then you can hit send and we will receive your question. So we can practice that right now. If you're viewing by yourself, there's no need to type anything at this time. However, if you're viewing in a group, please go to the chat window and type in the total number of additional people that are in the room with you today. Again, if you're viewing by yourself, there's no need to type anything at this time. However, if you're viewing in the group, select all panelists, type in the total number of additional people with you, and then hit send. Please note that within 24 hours, you will receive an automated email from WebEx that will be your certificate of attendance. Please keep an eye out in your email for your certificate. Here's the agenda for today's webinar. We'll start with, of course, my opening remarks and housekeeping. I'll turn it over to Nasmia. We'll have our presenters for today, a Q&A portion, and then I'll end with our next steps and conclusion. Again, please be sure to go and complete the poll question that's in your control panel. Without further ado, I will turn over today's uh, to our moderator, Nasmia. And Nasmia, whenever you are ready, please take it away. Thank you so much, William, and thank you all so much for joining us today. I think you're going to be able to get a lot of really great information from today's presentation. Um, as William said, my name is Ms. Mia Comrie. I'm a senior program specialist at the Office of Community Oriented Policing Services, the COPS office at the U.S. Department of Justice. And I am honored that Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention has asked me to moderate today's panel. Uh, with that, we're going to get right into it. And um, I'm going to introduce our first presenter, uh, Mr. Rick Ian, our director of research at Simon Wiesenthal Center. Uh, as you can see here, his bio, I'm just going to highlight some uh, key pieces so we can get right into the presentation. But in addition to his role as director of research at Simon Wiesenthal Center, he also, has work, he also works as a co-director of the Center's Digital Terrorism and Hate Project. He's worked extensively with California Post and Department of Homeland Security. And in his 36 years with Simon Wiesenthal Center, he has conducted hundreds of training sessions for law enforcement, 
educators, civic groups, and schools. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Director Ian. Thank you, good morning, or good afternoon for most of you. Uh, uh, I'm gonna, uh, okay, so, uh, as was said, I work with the Simon Wiesenthal Center. I won't spend too much time on that. Uh, my job is to talk about uh, talk about uh, extremist groups, hate groups uh, in the U.S. today, and, and we have a very unique situation. for For many years, we had very the majority of, of uh, hate groups were very traditional. Uh, they fit into specific categories, and you had. Uh, a number of people for many years uh, from the 60s to the early 2000s, as you see on the screen, that were were the some of the, the most of the top people in these extremist groups over the years. Well, uh, in early 2000, uh, two of these passed away, Butler and Pierce. Metzger got old and has since passed away. Matt Hale, who represented the younger generation, uh, has gone away to federal prison for 40 years. and. And for a long time, that left a vacuum uh, in the movement. Uh, there was really no leadership until uh, around 2015, when you had this, the beginnings of what you've all heard about the alt-right. And the alt-right uh, was a younger generation. They were very internet savvy. They got very heavily involved in the 2016 campaign and targeting uh, 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 people that, that they disagreed with, much more than extremist groups had ever got in, involved with, uh, with campaigns and things like that in the past. So uh, you, had the, you had the guy who coined the, the, alt, uh, the, tar the name, alt-right, Richard Spencer from the National Policy Institute, but uh, the alt-right really covered a lot of different, uh, a different uh, types of groups, and these are just some of them on the screen, the conspiracy theorists, theorists the uh, original white nationalist movement, which I, which uh, uh, was uh, many of the people that I showed you earlier, identitarian movements, young people, uh, not particularly affiliated with a philosophy as much as they would call themselves nationalists, uh, the trolls on some of the worst internet sites, Gamers and and uh, the manosphere people that were were uh, kind of on to take society back to the the uh, 1950s. So these are these are some of the traditional ideologies that we still see today. Although they're they're as I say, a lot of these groups are they were kind of caught like deer in the headlights after Charlottesville five years ago, and many of them face legal problems and the like. And the uh, while these groups are still around, they're not, they're not really, I mean, they're out there, they're, they're causing trouble, but they're not in some, many cases as prominent as they were before. But you see, uh, you know, the neo-Nazis, white supremacists, uh, Klan, which, you know, there's less and less all the time, identity, which is a philosophy of people that believe that the white race are actually the true Israelites, still have a few skinheads, although uh, not many, and the new, the new movement, uh, the so-called nationalists. Uh, these are just some of the, the groups uh, based in the U.S. today, some of the larger ones uh, that we see. The uh, one that you wouldn't really consider, for example, alt-right, but the American Freedom Party is, is guys in suits and ties that are uh, their main issue is immigration, but they're hardcore white supremacists as well. Uh, you have that Goyim Defense League, which I'll show you some flyers that they're distributing around the country in recent uh, in recent years, and and just some of the others. I can make this list available to anyone that needs it. Um, and for example, the, the NS131, one of their you may have heard just this this past weekend in Boston, one of their leaders was. Uh, arrested for targeting the LGBTQ community. Uh, so they are out there, they're active, but uh, we, we've reached a, 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 new, uh, a new kind of philosophy in, in extremism that I'm gonna talk about. We've had a, a changing times over, 
over the last uh, six or eight years since the uh, since, as I mentioned, 2015, you see the National Socialist Movement there. At one time on the left, they would always have swastikas and things like that. That changed for uh, quite a while, uh, making it kind of a, a, a softer uh, look, but that's now, that's now gone, gone back the other way. And you're gonna hear from, from somebody talk about that in just a minute. But you see other symbols a lot like the Celtic cross and as you see on the left there, the, the cog and the pitchfork uh, rep, rep, uh, representing the, uh, the, the working man and the, and the farmer. Uh, uh, kind of going back to, to uh, the country's roots, uh, but in, ex, in an extremist fashion. Uh, these are some of the new popular symbols of extremism. You see, for example, the uh, uh, Pepe the Frog, which was was kind of appropriated for the uh, symbol of the alt-right. Uh, you see the, the death's head in the center there. You've got the sun wheel, which is particularly popular with extremists. Most people wouldn't know what that is when they see it, uh, although it was, as you'll see in a minute, they were it was heavily used by people like Brenton Tarrant, the uh, Christchurch New Zealand mosque shooter. Uh, and then you have some of the traditional things like, like SS bolts and the like. Uh, the white nationalists, for example, I, I, you're all probably familiar with the guy on the right there. Uh, we've heard a great deal about him, but what you may not have seen are the, the uh, tattoos that he had. And, and uh, you see uh, the, the Valknut, also known as the uh, triple sevens or the triskelion, uh, which you see on the left there. And then also the hammer of Thor, which not exclusively a white supremacy symbol, it's an Odinist uh, uh, pagan religion uh, thing, but it is used heavily uh, by uh, the extremists of, of today. Uh, and then you have these people that are calling themselves Patriot, like the Patriot Front. Uh, as you'll hear from our next presenter, this is just a uh, a dodge to to draw people in thinking that they're doing something patriotic. And I'll, I'll let uh, him explain that. Uh, we're also seeing symbols like this, the, uh, uh, the use of Latin terms, the uh, references to the Crusaders, like the, the image down on the bottom left, uh, uh, the, uh, and the like. We, we see a lot more of this as opposed to those hardcore symbols that we saw before. Uh, and this one, Deus Vault, God wills it. Uh, this is a whole plan and you see the, the uh, uh, handbook for uh, resisting the great replacement, this theory that they believe is that uh, uh, white people are being replaced by, uh, uh, with a specific plan based on, you know, bringing in immigrants and and the like, and, and breeding out uh, white people altogether. Uh, you see the, the uh, uh, this is Brenton Tarrant in court, uh, and you see somebody did a nice Photoshop of putting him into uh, one of those uh, Crusader uh, uh, sets of armor with the cross of St. George. Very many references to this, this type of thing with the Crusaders. Again, this great replacement theory, which was promoted by uh, the mosque shooter, Brenton Tarrant. Uh, and Brenton Tarrant heavily influenced uh, uh, Peyton Gendron, the Buffalo shooter. And you see just some of the quotes here where he specifically draws quotes from uh, uh, Tarrant's uh, manifesto. And, said, and he, like Tarrant, he kind of interviews himself and, and you know, says my my uh, inspiration was in fact Brenton Tarrant. I, I want to show you one quick case study because this is this is we're we're seeing as I said we're, we we have these groups out there, but we're seeing less in terms of group activity and more in terms of individuals. So this is an internet site called iFunny. It's supposed to be a place for memes and and things like that, uh, but. Uh, people can create a profile. In this case, this guy, Minnesota nationalist, uh, put up this site, and you see on the right there, he said, if you're interested in 
and playing in Minecraft, get in touch with me and we'll, we'll get together. Uh, well, he uh, was a unique one because he was, only, he was only in high school when he put this up. He was very proud to post his uh, uh, graduation uh, certificate from his high school in Minnesota, uh, which was a, a great help to us because although he thought that he uh, blacked out, out enough so nobody could figure out who he was, uh, or white out as the case may be. Uh, he left just enough available that I had a very enterprising intern who looked at the high school, looked at what little little of the letters he could see and figured out who this guy was. Uh, we don't normally go and try to figure out who people were, but there was a specific reason that we did, which I wanna show you. This Remember, this is a uh, 17, 18 year old kid. Uh, on his iFunny profile, he had posted this picture on the left, and that is his own uh, uh, weapons magazines that he's got tyranny remover, and he's got uh, uh, the Brady Bill and things that, that uh, were, were made sense to him. Uh, but what concerned us was, is this is exactly what Brent Tor Tarrant, the Christchurch shooter, had done with uh, not only his magazines, but he had writing it all over his weapons, you know, talking about uh, the Great Replacement and different events in history that, that uh, he thought were very important, people's names who were, were uh, uh, killed by immigrants and others. So uh, he did that. He also made this statement saying that, uh, uh, you know, if you plan on shooting somebody, make sure you do it, make sure you do a, take out somebody who's high profile. So when we see, when we see uh, things like this, we immediately contact the FBI and, and let them know. Uh, and in this case, they paid him a visit. Uh, so we've seen something new, which I want to talk to you about now is, is there is a movement called the accelerationists. And, and this, is a, this, is, this is an extension of what has been going on for the last few years. You may have heard about the Adam Waffen Division, this shadowy neo-Nazi group responsible for five murders. Uh, there were a lot, they were on Telegram, there were a lot of uh, uh, different groups that were spawned by them using Waffen. Uh, and uh, they, they work on the philosophy of James, Ma James Mason, who wrote a book called Siege. And basically Siege says, accomplish your goals any way you can. Violence doesn't matter what, as long as you reach the ultimate goal. And now we have this, this is a beginning of the accelerationist movement, but then you also have even more and worse. Just recently, I couldn't even get it into the slides because it was, it happened so recently, a uh, pamphlet came out online called the, the Hard Reset, uh, which uh, talks about violence. And it's kind of, it's kind of a bit about the, the Turner Diaries on steroids, where they're talking about uh, destroying uh, water supplies and electrical supplies and so forth, uh, uh, killing and maiming people, uh, mostly mostly on Telegram, but in other places as well. And there, this this philosophy is what is inspiring others to uh, to go out and commit acts of violence. And and uh, we this pam this recent pamphlet that came out, the hard recent, is over 200 pages. It's put together by, uh, it claims, a group of different people. They all use, uh, they all use handles, so you have no idea who they are. Uh, but it's heavily promoting violence and uh, mainly using, as I say, Telegram, which is absolutely the worst uh, site uh, uh, on the internet and heavily used by extremist groups. Uh, this is uh, Siege. Uh, Mason's book, which you can get on alternative video platforms and, and other places online. And uh, one of the things that we've seen is this, this is a, a calendar that came out which celebrates the various people such as Robert Matthews, the leader of the order in the 1980s, but also some of the major shooters. And, uh, you know, it's a calendar that highlights uh, the events of that date, whether it's their birthdays, whether it's the date they committed an act of violence, and, and 
it's pretty disturbing stuff because they've got something on for almost every day of the year. Uh, that's just Matthews, more recently Dylan Roof, the uh, shooter from uh, South Carolina. More uh, on TikTok, we see things like Brent and Tarrant. And uh, I'll skip that there. Uh, so we produce a we produce uh, this uh, app called Digital Terror and Hate. You can also get it at the website at digitalhate.net. Uh, and we also uh, produce a, a thing on Symbol called Decoding Hate, which you can get on the Simon Wiesenthal Center uh, website. I, I'm very happy to introduce the next speaker because uh, he was a leader of a movement uh, for 20, 25 years, in it for 27, and when he posted his his uh, website and said, I'm getting out of the movement and going to do good, I uh, realized I had to, to meet this person immediately. He had important information, the freshest information of anyone who's gotten out of the movement, uh, and within a couple days of his posting a, a website and my seeing it, uh, I immediately uh, had a meeting with him uh, in Detroit. He's, he's a very important uh, voice for change. His name is Jeff Scoop, the former leader of the National Socialist Movement. And these days I'm very ha proud and happy to call him my friend. So I'm going to turn things over to him. Thank you. And real quick. I Thank you, Rick. Uh, before I hand it off to Jeff, I just I wanna I wanna thank Rick for kind of setting up, uh, setting us up and kind of giving that overview. And um, he did a fabulous job of introducing Jeff. Um, you know, I think what's also so important is that since Jeff has left in 2019, the National Socialist Movement, um, and you know, publicly denouncing this ideology. He has been speaking to students and communities and law enforcement about the dangers of hate and extremism and has made this his life's mission. Um, so with that, um, I want to hand it off to Jeff to give us an overview of extremism recruitment. Um, and so thank you. Thank you. So we're going to cover extremist recruitment and um, some of these organizations and what exactly they're doing and how to tell the differences. I think this is important for law enforcement because we have with far right extremism, we have you have gangs, you have skinheads, neo Nazis, white nationalists, Ku Klux Klan, accelerationists, as uh, my colleague and friend uh, Rick Eaton had explained. Um, these are a lot of the differences, but I think it's it's important for law enforcement to recognize the differences between a lot of these organizations, because when you're dealing with different people from these different uh, organizations, you're dealing with a whole plethora of different ideologies, of different ways of viewing law enforcement, different ways of, of viewing uh, their fellow humanity, and, and um, some of them are a lot more dangerous than others. Uh, obviously, none of them are, are uh, up to any good, but um, particularly, I think the concern needs to be with the accelerationists uh, movement. And as Rick touched upon a little bit, the hard reset. Now, this was something that had just come out uh, that we're aware of through our research, and they are talking about things in the hard reset book um uh, tackling and, and this is something i would not talk about in anywhere anywhere outside of a law enforcement uh community but they're talking about hard and soft targets now this was something that i was i was very concerned about and remain very concerned about because you have a lot of these mass shooters and and uh people that have went in and started killing people in walmarts and in grocery stores those would be their soft targets Hard targets would be people of of authority, you know, government figures, people that um, they would view as worthwhile to go after. So this is a, especially with the accelerationists, with the hard reset people, and these type of organizations. They pose a present and and uh, serious and inherent threat to the citizens of the United States, and it's something that we <clears throat> most certainly need to keep an eye on and. Uh, and be well aware of. You know, there's also criminal organizations. This is this is another differentiation. For example, as Rick mentioned, you know, I, I led the National Socialist Movement for 25 years, unfortunately. 
um, that would have been considered an above ground organization. That's not to say there wasn't people that got involved in illegal activity because that certainly did happen as well. But as a whole, the organization stayed uh, amongst, le amongst legality, above ground. That would be an above ground organization. When you have prison gangs like Aryan Brotherhood, um, or there's so many others as well, that's different. Now, those are still, um, you know, using white supremacist ideology sometimes and mainly symbolism, but that falls more into a gang category. That's completely different. And a lot of times their uh, modus operandi, so to speak, is drug dealing, other criminal activity and things like that, whereas your above ground organizations are not openly or endorsing those kind of things or in getting involved in those kind of things. So there's a big difference between these type of organizations. And I think that's important for law enforcement to understand and, and realize. Um, another thing that we found through some of our research, which is incredibly disturbing, some of the accelerationist types, as uh, Rick mentioned, you know, the base, Adam Waffen, um, groups of that nature, these are constantly changing. They're even having ones now called Rape Waffen or Rape Krieg. And we just uh, looked over a news article on that uh, last night where a US Marine was involved in that and was plotting on um, using rape as a weapon. Uh, that's even, even, from, even for someone like myself that had been involved in this stuff for well over 20 years. That's, that's new territory. That's something that was not talked about or even approved of in, in the majority of these organizations. Um, I can't speak for on the prison organizations because I didn't affiliate with them, but, um, for the above ground organizations, that's very, very odd and strange. So we're seeing a fluidity and we're seeing a lot of changing in how these organizations operate. There was a video that we saw just in the last month or in the last few weeks about taking down power grids in the United States and how that can be done. And they were pointing out, you're watching a video, you think you're watching something that's uh, it's got a guy in a construction hat pointing out things in a, in, on a power grid and the video stops with small arrows pointing to different things saying, this is where you would shoot. This is where you would take this out. So again, this is an, a clear and present danger to the United States and our citizens if people act on these things. So it's definitely something of, of great concern and that we should, be keeping, we should be keeping track of as much as possible. Recruitment, social media and online platforms, encrypted messaging, apps, um, such as Signal, and Rick uh, discussed a little bit of this as well, so we won't spend too much time on it, but um, Signal is an encrypted app that a lot of the organizations and a lot of the people in these groups like to use. You can set up disappearing messages and, and things like that, and it's encrypted. It's, it's uh, difficult to get into. Now, from a law enforcement perspective, if you're seizing phones in a raid or, or in an arrest or, or anything of that nature, um, not everybody that uses Signal is setting up disappearing messages. So you might still be able to uh, capture some of those conversations in there if illegal activity is going on. Discord, this is another one. Um, this has been popularized by a lot of the alt-right groups and it had been used um, quite heavily by a lot of different organizations as, um, as a way to communicate. Um, Discord is another, is another place. Um, Telegram chats and channels, Rick covered uh, Telegram a bit, and there are, are countless channels and, and uh, chats on Telegram that, that go uh, across the gamut as far as these, organization goes, uh, these organizations go. Um, if anyone in law enforcement needs uh, references as far as where these channels are, we are working on a database right now, um, but it's constantly changing because Sometimes these uh, channels are deleted by by telegram other times they just keep going. So um, this is constantly evolving, but we are trying to keep up on it as well as possible, along with our uh, friends at the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Uh, it's critical because you're catching a lot of these conversations and, and things like that um, in these <clears throat> in these channels. Um, another thing on that when the app is downloaded via the website extremist content is more accessible. So that's something to keep in mind too, if you're doing research or you're looking into Telegram, get the app as far as that goes and, uh, and you'll have access to more content. TikTok, uh, believe it or not, um, a lot of our kids are watching things on TikTok. 
Um, there is extremist content on there. It's not as great as, uh, or it's not as uh, profound, excuse me, profound. It's not as uh, uh, common as it would be on Telegram, but it is there. So they're using things on TikTok, Instagram Reels, places you wouldn't expect it. YouTube, short videos for short attention spans. Back when I was involved in the National Socialist Movement, we would put our propaganda out and I would I would ask people to keep it about the size of a music video, about three and a half minutes. Um, and that would be your, your content, your propaganda to try to reach people. Now we are seeing that, especially with TikTok and the Instagram reels, these things are like two minutes max. So sometimes these uh, propaganda messages can be just 30 seconds and they're, use, they're using memes and other ways uh, to try to recruit video games. They're utilized to recruit and spread the message and gain interest. In video games, they're using platforms like Roblox, Minecraft. Um, these are games for, for kids. So they are trying to recruit kids in these, in these areas. Now, adults use these things too. It's not just kids. Call of Duty, that's more kids and adults. Um, but any of these type of games. Um, in the NSM, we had a, uh, different people that went into PlayStation Network and places like that, anywhere where you have a headset where you can talk and, and go back and forth with other users, and they were recruiting in there all the time um, to meet people that way. So that's something to keep an eye on as well, um, especially for anyone that has children at home. You, your children could be hearing extremist messaging. You wouldn't have any idea because it's in their, it's in their headset. They're hearing it. So uh, we're constantly seeing that sort of thing. Music, um, all genres, rock against communism is one, but um, all different genres of music are being used to promote this type of ideology. Everything from black metal to country to rap and everything in between. So um, this type of thing is, is increased in, in recent years. Um, but as Rick mentioned, the skinhead scene is down um, in numbers back in time in the past, it was easy to spot these guys because of the tattoos and, and the messaging and all that sort of thing. Now, uh, with the movement, a lot of people look like your next door neighbor. It's not always that guy that's covered in, in swastika tattoos. In fact, more often than not, it's not that guy anymore. You still have some of those uh, out there, but it is not as, as common as it was. Traditional methods, stickers, leafleting, pamphleting, magazines, protests, demonstrations, things like that. These groups are all involved in those traditional methods as well. So any type of method where they can recruit or where they can reach people, they're gonna be involved in this type of stuff. Now here's some examples of some of the memes and uh, why I feel this is important is, is here, look at the one on the left, white boy summer, the bright colors and all that, that wouldn't catch somebody's eye typically as being extremist content, but you can see the black sun behind the woman. Um, there. Uh, be the extremist the media says you are. Um, a lot of extremists do not trust, most extremists do not trust the media. And um, this is a, a, a play on that. Another meme here, this one is important. The tree of liberty is not going to water itself. Looks fairly innocuous, right? Well, this guy here in the photo has a GoPro cam on his helmet. And as Rick mentioned with some of the mass shooters, they're doing that with the GoPros. They wanna film it, they wanna be famous, they wanna be martyrs, they wanna be considered saints. Um, all these type of things, this uh, messaging is there. So um, when you see something like this, it normally wouldn't pique uh, you know, one's interest. You know, If you're looking at it even from a law enforcement standpoint, you say, well, why, why is this something to worry about? It's just a guy with a GoPro on his helmet. Well. It's it's subliminal messaging. They're basically saying, hey, they're not calling for violence openly, so it slips under the radar. You could post that on probably Facebook or other places as well, and it would slip under the radar. But but uh, those in the know or those that they're that are already involved in it are going to know exactly what that means. So this this last meme over here, we're already at war. This is a, a more accelerationist messaging, but this is how the mindset of the people that are involved in this, how they feel, how they look at the world. Um, I, I could say from my time and my involvement when I was involved, even in an above ground organization, um, we often viewed the world as, as we were at war with the world. That, that was just basically how it was viewed. That's, that's a fairly common uh, thought process for people that are involved in, in uh, this type of ideology. The far right adapts and exploits hot button issues. 
Um, this young man here is Jordan Sparks on, on the left of your screen where it says diversity won't bring me back. He was run over in uh, Waukesha, Wisconsin in that Christmas Day um, parade car attack. The far right, uh, and which is a horrible thing that, that took place, but the far right will exploit issues like this and say, uh, there was some research that the guy that was involved in the, sh in the uh, car attack was a uh, Black Lives Matter supporter. So they will expose things like that, bring it up and say, look, this is why we're at war. They're, they're killing our kids. They're, this is what they're doing. They'll take any horrific uh, example they can and try to uh, weaponize that against their enemies. And that's exactly what this is about. And, and it's, it's taking a horrific uh, a horrific thing that happened and exploiting it. And it was something that both above ground and below ground or underground organizations do. <clears throat> it's very common. Numbers and significant dates, 88, the eighth letter of the alphabet, 131, anti-communist action. You see the A, C, A, Confederate Hammerskins, 38, they're, they're matching with the alphabet. The 14 words, 1488, Hitler's birthday, uh, 420, the 14th day initiative. This is this for accelerationists are saying um, we should be celebrated as a day of action each month. So it's something to keep an eye on there. I had a July 4th here because for the first time this year, we were seeing messaging where they were saying July 4th is the time that you should go out and shoot people because the police won't come. They'll think it's fireworks. And that, that was some messaging that we saw on some different channels that was uh, very interesting, um, sad, and I thought it was, was uh, something we should mess it, uh, mention today. Extremist patches and symbols. This is some of the, uh, we're running out of time here, but uh, we're going to cover this real quick. Um, some of the different organizations, um, the messaging here with uh, the Ku Klux Klan on the, on the far right over here, the state divisions. Um, basically, these are patches of different extremist groups. Some of them are obvious, some of them are not but these are all uh, messaging and things that they use. Community education and engagement, Beyond Barriers. Uh, Beyond Barriers is our nonprofit organization that we started, and these are some of our programs. Community engagement and education, Save Schools, Student Anti-Violence Engagement, Peace, Police Engagement, and Community Excellence. Counter Extremism and Prevention Methods, Relational Dialogue, Civil Discourse Seminars, and Workshop Trainings. We work hand in hand with community and outreach leaders, religious institutions, places of worship, civic organizations, community groups, et cetera. We provide counter narrative messaging projects, podcasts, videos, animated videos, et cetera, and are engaged in disengagement and de-radicalization services. So check us out at beyondbarriersusa.org. Check out the Simon Wiesenthal Center, who we also work very closely with. And um, we're all doing our part here to try to make a difference in the world. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for having me again. And uh, I hope that was informative. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, I think that that was a really, really helpful presentation. Uh, so before I introduce our next speaker, I just want to put a reminder uh, that if you have questions, feel free to add to the chat uh, so that we can be able to answer those towards the end of the presentation or towards the end of the webinar today. Uh, so, our next presenter is Miriam Churchill. She's the executive director of Parents for Peace. She has over 30 years of experience as a psychotherapist working in a variety of settings and with a range of populations in Europe and the US. She has experience working with interventions with first and second generation North African immigrant sex workers, uh, as well as doing facilitated group therapy in a juvenile detention center. She's also worked as a group therapy counselor in an inpatient dual diagnosis unit, as well as a dual diagnosis drop-in center. She has several life coaching and professional coaching certifications and has maintained a coaching practice. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Executive Director Churchill to talk about youth extremism and grooming strategies. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so, um, I can see that oh, one of my slides is missing. That's okay. Um, so before I uh, introduce uh, the work we do at Pants for Peace, uh, I would like to uh, you know quickly uh, share with you about you know about the you know uh, the, the the tragedy that led Mr. Melvin Bodso 
to co-found Pants for Peace. Um, so Mr. Bafso's son, Carlos, uh, as known as uh, Abdul Hakim Mohammed, was arrested in 2009 in Arkansas after shooting two innocent men in front of the military recruitment center. So he killed one man and wounded another, and now he's uh, serving uh, several life sentences. Uh, so he, uh, Carlos was actually uh, recruited, he was groomed and recruited by a charismatic professor uh, on campus. So Melvin uh, told me that I sent my son to get an education and it turned out to be a nightmare. Uh, he told me uh, I'm a business owner and I created the Blue City uh, tour bus so my children can be exposed to different culture, nationality, and meeting people from all around the world. And I got worried when Carlos uh, refused to drive uh, one of the buses because the customers were Jewish. By the way, uh, Carlos' uh, goal before he shot into the recruitment center was to actually um, create a shooting in a synagogue. So, um, you know, uh, very quickly, uh, you know, about, we have uh, the theory about extremism as an addiction and, you know, and we think you know, we think of hate as a drug of choice by providing the individual with a way to channel anger and resentment. Um, so extremism provides a superficial appealing solution by offering an opportunity for numbing and a sense of belonging. It's very hard to think about extremism as a coping mechanism. Uh, it's destructive, but it's very much a way people feel, you know, find comfort on, and the, the group structure of extremism and organized ideology. So uh, this is our team. This is our, um, you know, uh, specialists, you know, uh, 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 first responders. You know, many of you probably already know uh, some of our uh, team. Uh, our team. Uh, Pardeep, uh, you know, is an intervention specialist. He's also a survivor of, um, of a shooting. Many of you probably remember when Michael Page, a uh, white supremacist, uh, shot the, you know, the Sikh temple and murdered his father and many other members of his community. Uh, so uh, actually uh, next week our team is going to Wisconsin because it already is the 10th anniversary of the Sikh temple shooting. Uh, Mubin is a former Islamist uh, and Chris is a former veteran and clan member. Um, so um, let's see, okay. Uh, so we have launched our helpline in 2016 uh, uh, in beta phase to provide services for families whose loved ones were being radicalized. Uh, there was no helpline at that time and we want to bridge that gap. So Parents for Peace warning system is made out of people, family members, uh, school teachers, guidance counselors, anyone really that is close of, you know, of the person that is being radicalized. Um, you know, there's uh, a great need, you know, to develop a preventive aspect rather than a reactive intervention. So our helpline is helping family uh, before things get out of hand, but there is a whole world of prevention that needs to be uh, developed. Uh, so since 2016, we handled cases, uh, you know, at a national and international level. You'll be surprised about you know, that we get calls from uh, New Zealand and, you know, and even Australia, people are willing to wake up in the middle of the night to get services, you know, so it's a little overwhelming the, the, the places where people call us because they are so desperate. So we have some from QAnon to white supremacy to anti-far and far left. So we have Islamists, eco-terrorism. We have black supremacists, black Hebrew Israelites. Uh, some of the far left have been groomed by their teachers and later on groomed by organizations such as the YPG and today are actually fighting in Syria and Iraq. Um, what most of these hate groups have in common is their strong hatred towards Jews. Uh, Jews are most of the time their number one uh, scapegoat. Um, so 60% uh, of our cases are young people that are diagnosed with ASD or autism spectrum disorder uh, and also severe ADHD. Um, I think Jack was talking earlier about, you know, today you see people, you know, you don't, it's not really the tattooed person with swastika that you see anymore. It's really, you know, kids that could be kids from your neighborhood uh, and, and going to good schools and from good families. Um, so often these kids have been bullied and struggled to, communi to communicate the humiliation and pain they were going through. 
So people with ASD are often in danger to be a good target for predators to use their vulnerability to recruit them into hate groups. Um, in several cases, young men um, uh, have been sexually molested. Some suffer from, uh, from some kind of you know, form of trauma. Some get groomed into extremism because of an identity crisis and, uh, and often also of perceived grievances. Uh, so our helpline reports two main uh, vulnerable groups. So we, of, we are often, uh, you know, they are often the target of grooming. So there's the youth and also the veterans. So sadly, uh, the media and politicians to broadcast on the issue of extremism is too often misleading and doesn't represent the complexity of it. I know that uh, everyone wants to focus on white supremacy, and I understand that for many CVE organizations, white supremacy is their bread and, and their, their bread and, and butter. But this tendency is not giving the complex picture of radicalization. So you might be surprised to hear that among our, our neo-Nazi and white supremacist cases, so many are white Christians, some are Muslims, some are Mexicans or from different uh, Latin American origins, uh, some are from the Middle East, uh, you know, such as like, Egypt. And we even had a Jewish young man who joined a neo-Nazi group. Unfortunately, this information is not broadcasted in the news or from anyone. Many cases we work with start by, you know, by, start by being, you know, joining like an eco-terrorist group and shifted into becoming an Islamist. Some were white Islamists convert uh, and to shift into a neo-Nazi group and shift again into a Christian extremism. We have white supremacists that end up joining ISIS and people from Antifa that joined the YPG in Syria, some white supremacists have joined Antifa. So that might surprise many of you, but it's really more common, you know, from what we are seeing in our helpline. Uh, unfortunately, the high politicization of this issue is making this problem worse. Ironically, the, divisive, the divisiveness and tribalism amongst politicians is modeling the us versus them ideology, which mimics the extremism ideology of us versus them. So this is the process uh, of, you know, the, the process of, you know, when someone calls our helpline, we use our intake protocol that is very detailed, uh, something that we have actually uh, designed, uh, you know, from the inside of family members and former supremacists. And it helps us collect uh, information from family history, the mental health and addiction history, and many other important information to have a better understanding about the person of concerns. Uh, we also do a threat assessment to determine if the person is a threat to self or others. Um, often callers who are worried about a loved one falling into extremism don't understand the ideology and they don't know what to do about this. They often are upset, uh, as you can imagine, and want to fact check the person that expresses hate. So we must educate them in order to not make uh, the situation worse. Um, so we equip families with tools and strategies to build communication uh, with their loved one and to strengthen the family bond. Actually, it's really one of the focus on my, my personal intervention is I realize that, you know, uh, extremism cannot really grow when the family uh, unit is, you know, is uh, vulnerable. Uh, so the straining of the family bond is uh, crucial. Uh, so we also find opportunities to have former supremacists to join an intervention team, and we and we work cross ideology. Um, so we call, as I mentioned earlier, we call hate extremism a drug of choice because we find that youth enter extremism to numb or cope with their pain, or you know, or you know, just as if they were using a drug. Um, so this is a long process, you know, uh, and, you know, sometimes we speak to the families on a weekly uh, basis uh, uh, and uh, we need, you know, uh, you know, so you have to think about it as more like someone that is going into a recovering or healing or recovering process from, you know, from addiction to opioid. It takes time. Um, okay. So, uh, the, you know, parents for peace success in terms of mitigating a situation that could be violent is to act as early as possible 
and on empowering and guiding families who call our helpline. Uh, you know, as soon as they see the first sign of radicalization. So for the past two years, I would say that we have developed a great partnership with law enforcement to refer to us pre-criminal cases. And, uh, you know, and so uh, we reach out to them, uh, you know, as well when the cases, you know, end up a subject of uh, a very concerning matter, you know, when we know that this is beyond what we can do. So we all know that the combination of substance use, mental health diagnosis, guns, and involvement with hate group is a recipe that, that can end up with violence, you know, so those are kind of like really signals for us that we need to reach out to the law enforcement. So I'd like to uh, share with you a few uh, cases, you know, uh, uh, that we had. You know, actually, in this uh, slide, the the date is uh, is uh, wrong. This is a, a an, uh, this is like a, a recent case. Uh, so this is like a, a mother from Maryland who contacted us, and she was extremely worried because she found 15 uh, uh, rifles under her her son's bed, and a lot of you know uh, you know uh, pamphlets and things that were quite disturbing. Uh, so this is a young man that had with a history of mental, you know, mental illness, was misdiagnosed. His therapist was very much uh, minimizing the situation, and you know, and so. But when he got fired, you know, things got really uh, worse, you know. Uh, and so um, in uh, in the slide also it says that we uh, the current status is unknown, but we recently we had some great developments. I uh, reached out to an FBI agent to refer me uh, actually to uh, a local, uh, you know, agent in Maryland. Uh, so uh, hopefully, you know, what we were lucky about is that they got the knock on the door, and the law enforcement was able to confiscate, you know, the you know those guns. Um, often, uh, FBI agent that we work with, you know, in partnership with the family, because that's how we want to work. We want we rather family reach out to the law enforcement with us, and we work as a team. And uh, often what the law enforcement tell us, you know, is that they cannot say for sure if uh, uh, calling the law enforcement have helped, you know, uh, stop a mass shooting, but they are very glad when we were refer them cases that seems to be incredibly concerning. So this next uh, case uh, is, you know, that was actually uh, in, uh, in the media, but just for the uh, for the sake of these families that I'm hoping for them to kind of really heal you know, their family. I'm not going to share their, you know, their identity, but this is a case where I wish the NYPD contacted us, you know, earlier because they've been watching this kid for two years. And so, um, you know, so uh, this, uh, this kid, you know, this is like a white convert into Islam. This is a family, Catholic family. Wonderful, their only son who was about to go to Yemen and um, and was arrested. Actually, the FBI agent was an informant, and the family were really heartbroken to find out that they said that he, he would not miss his family because his real family would be in Yemen. That's what uh, you know radicalization do to people. So I see I'm getting out of time. So maybe I uh, skipped the uh, last case study. Uh, that was actually a very successful case. Very shortly to say that this is. When we worked with the FBI and the family, uh, this is kind of a case where the mom would wake up in the middle of the night to hand the phone to the FBI agent to look into the phone um, because we were afraid that this kid will be going to Yemen. And that was also another situation, you know, that, you know, we're working together with the, you know, with the FBI and the family members can be incredibly, you know, successful. So I just want to end with this, that our, our team has found a way to partner with law enforcement to mitigate concerning situation um, and, you know, for us to, re to receive referrals from law enforcement before the situation becomes criminal and lead to incarceration. Um, we know that the prison system leads often to further radicalization and our preference is to be able to act as soon as possible. The challenge is not every law enforcement to know our number, and we wish if they would call 1-844-497-3223 before, you know, the case becomes, uh, you know, um, uh, criminal. And we really are actually open to be guided to get more personal contact by state so we kind of act and reach out to law enforcement as soon as possible. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for that presentation. And um, 
Mary, would you be able to put your that phone number in the chat so that everyone can get that um, for those referrals? I think that that'd be really helpful. Um, yes, absolutely. Thank absolutely. You. Thank you very much. And and you know, offline maybe if we can find a way for law enforcement to to guide us about how to have a person of contact. Thank you so much. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, so our next presentation is uh, David Lewis, Senior Policy Advisor at Bureau of Justice Assistance. Um, at BJA, he oversees programs that address cybercrime, criminal intelligence, and national information sharing projects. Before joining BJA, he served as the project director for both the Ohio Justice Information Network and the Ohio Juvenile Justice Information System at the Ohio Office of Criminal Justice Services. And his career also includes 24 years in law enforcement. And David today is going to be talking about the BJA's state and local anti-terrorism training program. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it off to David and just put another reminder to put your questions in the chat box. So thank you. Thank you, Nazia. Um, thank you for this opportunity to be here. Um, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, just so you all know, is a sister agency to the um, Office of Juvenile Justice Programs uh, here at the Office of Justice Programs. So while well, we're um, this program that I'm going to talk about, this uh, state and local anti-terrorism training program, or SLAT as we call it, has to do really with uh, providing uh, training to uh, law enforcement in dealing with very specifically um, terrorism, targeted violence, and hate crimes. And we see how they, as we go through the programs, are all very um, integrated between each of them. But what we do is we provide specifically training resources and technical assistance to our partners at state, local, tribal, and territorial agencies across the nation. Um, where the, what this really program, this program uh, has been around for quite a few years. Uh, it developed in response after the bombing uh, of the federal building in Oklahoma City and is designed specifically and has changed over the years um, on terrorist indicators and activity, uh, starting originally with uh, international terrorism, moving to domestic and now to targeted violence and hate crimes. Uh, over the years of the program, you can see that there were over 425,000 law enforcement professionals that have received this training throughout the country. Our training courses right now, uh, we've had to do a little bit of a switch. Um, we used to do all of our training as in-person training. We are now doing virtual and now moving back to some in-person. But we have uh, three key courses, prepare, pr protect, and disrupt. And as you can see, each of these programs have a focal point on some element in law enforcement. So we, what we do, even though they have a, a very um, um, focal point in, in there, we know that there's definitely crossovers in the different areas in law enforcement. Now, when we look at the cur our curriculum, we look at this, you know, this international terrorism versus homegrown violent extremism. Um, we see that these crossovers, you've heard people talk about it today. You've seen how uh, things are influenced from an international level coming into our domestics. But we also, as we've heard um, how they're using a modernization or using digital communication. And we'll talk a little bit that in, in a, a, some upcoming slides. Now, one of the things is we've seen uh, the number of incidents that have happened across the United States most recently is we're seeing this uh, huge increase in domestic terrorism and this domestic violent extremism. Uh, so there are different categories, but one of the important things is we look at uh, how the agencies are reporting this and finding out um, how we uh, move to the future and, and taking a look at these different things. Now, the other things that we like to look at this curriculum focus, we look at um, this targeted violence. In other words, what's the pathway? What are the behaviors? What happens? How do people get to where they are uh, prior to when this occurred? Um, how um, communities are doing, how they can prepare for it. Uh, I know we always seem to be, when these events happen, are very uh, reactive. How do we become a little more proactive? So training we, we find is extremely important. And as everybody is, that seems to be a common theme as that all the presenters have been here uh, on uh, today's webinar. Now we look at hate crimes, challenges, strategies, and resources. The one thing that I will tell you is, um, you know, we look at the definition of hate crimes, but what are the challenges, challenges and strategies? The one thing I will tell you about this is we go to the field. How does the field help us 
to identify what are the proper strategies, what are the proper uh, challenges, what are those kind of things. This is not a program where it's a federal program built and pushed down to the state, locals, and tribal, ter uh, tribal and territorial law enforcement. So then what we do is we help develop these resources. And we look at these resources based on a couple of things. What are the current trends and issues? What are, what's the field telling us that they need as opposed to us telling what we think they need? Uh, so when we look again, I, I'm talking about these, uh, all the courses that we talked about. When we look at these um, priorities that we have here. So we gotta look at these things and we use this as our straw man or our focal point so we can say, these are what each of these courts have to address. These are the items that we find most important. And, I, and several of the presenters here have shared case studies. And we have found that to be an excellent uh, training tool because people can say, yes, I can put all these things in place, but what, how, do, how is it actually used? So that's extremely, extremely important. Now, one of the things that we've seen, and especially with all these uh, incidents that are happening across the United States, is what is actually targeted violence? So when we look at this idea of targeted violence, uh, we see this increasing threat and the things that come from, it's not just terrorism, but hate crimes. And you know, what are these, what is the actual basis for this targeted violence? Unfortunately, we see, we talked about gaming and we talked about all these other things, but one of the things is uh, we're looking at violence. Our society today that a lot of people are saying violence is a solution to a problem. I'm, look, I'm like working through it as we have done sometimes in the past. Uh, the other thing is we look at this radicalization and, and what's going on and, and how, what are the warnings? What are the things that are going on? And the one thing about the lone actors, and we'll talk about this um, in, in, a, in a few slides, but I wanna just put this um, um, graphic up here talking about what is the pathway. So it usually starts with some personal grievance, some personal uh, uh, ideology, something that they have or they've learned or have been um, taught. And then they look and they start to say, what's my, what's my next step, my research, my planning? Uh, how do I prep for this? Um, then they start looking at uh, what do they do? They do the research and then the attack actually occurs. And this is, seems to be very consistent with uh, after most of these events occur. Now, when we look at this, just the brief summary showing you uh, what we say here is the, you know, the lack of the, the drivers that they have. But this last, this last point, the bullet point I want you to really be uh, familiar with is lone actors are very difficult to detect and disrupt. Um, that's why we're gonna talk and Jeff talked a little bit about use of the internet and digital technology. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, so when we talk about SLAT, how we're address, addressing hate crimes. When we look at these things, we, these are the con traditional crimes that go along uh, when we're talking about hate crimes. And I just wanted to say this definition of the FBI, this is the basic definition that we're using. But I will tell you right now that we have, things have changed as trends change and everything else. There are other motivating factors. So the other thing is, and, and bullet point number three is important to mention, is hate itself is not a crime. The only thing is, you have if you dislike something or, or you still have to respect other people's uh, freedom of speech, privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties. Now this, uh, this quote came from our DAG, uh, Lisa Monaco, and it really talks about uh, the overview of what's happening in our communities, what's happening, and what's the, what's the role of the Department of Justice. I just wanna talk real quick, and um, as we talk about these things, there are federal and state hate crimes. It's very important, and we talk about here, as I mentioned, it's very important that, yes, the federal government, um, FBI, um, agencies, U.S. Attorney's Office, and so forth, they have federals, but they're also state. The one thing is, the common goal is, we have to work together. It's, it's extremely important that state, local, tribal, and territory work in conjunction with the federal agencies. Uh, we know that the U.S. Attorney's Office does the prosecution, but we also have um, the, the state uh, attorney generals, those kind of things. We have to have that working relationship. And if we don't, we're gonna continue to fail to address these issues that are out there. 
Now, I will tell you, and we'll look at the this Bureau of, you know, what the, the FBI is actually doing, and it's very clear. These are the rules that they have, and these are the way that they're addressing uh, these hate crimes and targeted violence. But I put this last bullet point in here that I can't stress it enough, is this ability to work in conjunction with state, local, tribal, and territorial. I laugh sometimes because uh, after spending a number of years in local law enforcement, now that I work for the federal government and we've heard this, uh, I'm from the federal government, I'm here to help you. And, I, and we get chuckles about that all the time. But it's important to know that that working relationship is how we, solve, how we actually solve these problems. Now, I wanted to also talk about the importance of reporting hate crimes. You have these number of places here where hate crimes are going to report it, but we'll, we see a large number are not reported. Why? Because people are in shame, people are, are embarrassed, or whatever. For whatever reason, the re failure to report is detrimental to creating the appropriate training for state, local, tribal, and territorial, and our communities. Uh, as we see this, uh, that says here, only about a third of the hate crimes are, re are reported. And, and we talked a little bit about why they're doing it. But this, I can't stress enough, becomes a critical, critical element in how we identify the current trends, what the training's gonna be, and how we address being uh, proactive versus reactive. Now, most recently, the SLAT program uh, did uh, two uh, webinars, and I'm gonna just highlight them very quickly here. Uh, and the first one was, um, the Changing Threat and Landscape of Terrorism on Violent Extremism. This was done through our partnership, uh, the Director Bill Brannon uh, from the START program at the University of Maryland. And it talked about the different ways and, the, uh, and what they're using, the weapons, the tactics, targets, and so forth. But what uh, it also talked about is the importance of understanding what's going on and how, to, how law enforcement needs to be um, quick to respond, has to be nimble, know what the organizational needs are, and so forth. The, net, the other webinar that we did was understanding the characteristics and motivations of the offender. Now, this was extremely well received, that people understanding what this actually is. What, what is the offender? Now, this is a, we, another one of our sister agencies. This was a study done by the National Institute of Justice, or NIJ. And um, this really gave an overview, had some great charts. You can see these. They're available on the uh, SLAT website. So I'll ask if you have an opportunity to go out there and, and do those. Uh, I, I recommend that you do. Um, in my, uh, I want to wrap up with use of the internet and social media. Um, we've talked about how um, how they're using these. Uh, Jeff provided a lot of example of the apps and so forth that are being used. But what I want to talk about is just what are the focus. In other words, their idea. They're posting things, videos, um, messages. Uh, photos, things about what they're actually doing, which are incriminating in themselves sometimes. Uh, so uh, how they're communicating, uh, what they're seeking, seeking like groups, not just to see what's going on, but either joining, following, or participating, and looking at recruitment radicalization. But finally, they're using the social media to make their final statement. Now, law enforcement, what, being aware of what's in your community, uh, having officers that know how to go, what to look for. Uh, taking these training classes, um, the Bureau of Justice Assistance and uh, the FBI, Secret Service all have how to use uh, open source tools. Educating these officers, staying uh, up to date, knowing the limitations and protecting privacy and civil liberties as opposed to doing your law enforcement investigation. I just wanted to touch, real, uh, touch base quickly on some hate crime federal resources. Here we have, with the, this is the, from the Department of Justice Hate Crimes website. Uh, this is the FBI's website, and um, this is the SLAT website. This is actually the SLAT.org website. Uh, it is limited. Uh, there is some information, uh, general information, but uh, for law enforcement, you usually have to have a uh, account with either the FBI law enforcement uh, portal or the regional information sharing systems or RISC. So, um, as I mentioned about SLAT and creating these resources, these resources come from uh, federal, uh, from the field up, not from the federal down. So input and hearing from, from the field is extremely important to us. I will end with this slide and then um, 
Our goal, our whole goal is this partnership between law enforcement and communities, and this is law enforcement at all levels of government, from federal to local to tribal, all across the board. So that's extremely important. I will say thank you with that. I think I'm within my time frame. I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, David, and and thank you all to all of our presenters. I think that that was really valuable information. Um, so with that, we're going to kind of move into some discussion. Uh, I already have received some questions, so I'm going to try to address those first. But if you do have any other further questions, please add them to the chat. And David, this is one follow up for you. Uh, are there any statistics or ideas about the increased threat for targeting young females? Uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting um, question. We just had that question come up. Uh, what we use uh, in the SLAT program, um, which I'm going to use all the people that have presented today, but using subject matter experts. In other words, um, we, and I, this is a total change before I got into to law enforcement, we thought we knew everything. And we're finding out we don't know as much, but what we're doing is getting this input and saying, how do we address exactly what they're talking about? Uh, we, I, I don't, I can't answer that question on any uh, paths or what the trends are right now, but the question has um, has been raised to us before. Thank you. And just want to open it up. Anyone else on the panel have it, um, a response about, are there any statistics or ideas about the increased threat for targeting young females? All right, uh, we'll come back if somebody else has anything on that one. Uh, the next question is actually for Jeff. Uh, what made you leave the nationalist and if you got any threats from leaving? Leaving leaving was a process for me. It, it took, uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna try to condense this in just a couple of minutes because it's a long story, but uh, um, it was through interpersonal relationships with people of other races, uh, to put it uh, concisely and shortly. It was being able to see the humanity in in others, which when you're involved in an extremist organization, you only see the humanity of the people that are around you in your bubble, in your echo chamber or behind your barriers. So having those interpersonal conversations and being able to see the humanity of others is was a was a huge part of it. And then the second part of the question was, uh, could you repeat that back to me again? It was, it was what made you leave and if you got any threats from leaving on oh, the threats, the threats. Uh, yes, of course. Um, at 1st, when I left, I retired, but I knew I was going to speak out, but I needed to process everything. So the moment I started speaking out, which was about 6 months or so after I left. Yes, the threats definitely started pouring in and, and that sort of thing. So it's, it's, it's certainly, uh, uh. There's some danger involved and things like that, but it's it's for me, it's doing the right thing and, and trying to make a difference in the world, especially after uh, and repairing some of the damage done by my past. So. Thank you. Um, so, Miriam, I think I'm going to address some of these uh, school and youth questions your direction, but I encourage the other panelists to step in on this. Um, so, uh, first question is, are there organizations that are working to educate parents about recruitment strategies? Um, Thinking of friends whose young school sons play Roblox. So, Miriam and Jeff, I'll kind of direct this first question to you. So, our main work is to work with parents and family uh, because they get overwhelmed. They don't know what to do, and sometimes they make the situation worse. So, part of our work is is literally educating families to understand what is what's happening in their family and how to prevent it and how to turn it around. Uh, you said that you had a, a question about schools as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll get back. Let me see, Jeff. Do you have anything okay. else to add to that before I jump to the schools piece? As far as the de-radicalizing, de-radicalizing people and, and it's giving them another framework. It's, it's showing them like the relational dialogue program that, that we have is basically, it's not telling somebody they're wrong. We know they're wrong. Uh, the public knows they're wrong, but they sure don't. They're, they're embedded in that ideology. So reframing things and posing questions to them through, through dialogue, engaging them in conversation, everybody wants to be heard. Um, so how, being able to listen even even though what they're saying is is might be repulsive and and uh hard to listen to listening to them and then uh 
inserting questions and uh, and reframing ways of looking at things can make a real difference because it as it, it gets the person to start questioning their ideology and why they think a certain way and and that sort of thing. So it's not an instantaneous snap of a finger's change, but it it, it can plant the seeds for future change. Great, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to group up some of these questions, Marianne. So we have a question around how should schools respond to hate group involvement by students. But alternatively, how should uh, teachers and school staff start to think about identifying youth who may be at an increased risk for being radicalized? So thinking about it from those two perspectives. So I'm very grateful for the question, by, by the way, uh, because uh, I mean, I could spend a long time just speaking about the school situation. So first of all, the school is a niche for recruitment. People need to remember that. It's a, the best place to recruit young people. The, Biggest challenge ever is that the schools are very badly equipped to respond to this issue, and sometimes they make the situation from bad to worse. They become enablers, or they kind of really are part of the problem. Um, you know, I mean, you have no idea how upsetting this situation is for me because the school are the, the first place that could do something. The problem is we have found them being very resistant, very reluctant. We have proposed many times, we have worked with kids that are in the school, we have reached out to the guidance counselor, to the teachers to be part of the intervention. And unfortunately, they would be dragging their feet and we're trying to avoid it altogether when actually they could be doing so much. So unfortunately, I don't have a good news uh, a matter of the schools. And I really hope that we could do much better, you know, in order to educate and equip schools because they can, a lot of things could be prevented. You know. Thank you. Uh, still keeping on the school piece, um, and David and Rick, I'm probably going to bring you into this one, is how have school districts worked in collaboration with law enforcement to share information about escalating concerns with student behavior? So thinking about that relationship with that local law enforcement agency. Is this one, is this one for me as well? If you want to answer that, and then I'll give it to David and Rick. Uh, this is David Lewis from BJ. I'll just jump in real quick. Um, I know we're working in, uh, just as with the COPS office, uh, working with the school resource officers and creating that relationship with law enforcement. Um, I'll tell you, probably one of the best programs um, that was out there and, and building that relationship uh, for those that may or may not remember the D.A.R.E. program. It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it didn't really address the anti-drug issue but it was a huge asset in building relationships between uh, teachers, parents, and students with local law enforcement. So um, with um, the lack of funding now, we see a lot of police departments that don't have crime prevention units anymore or um, community service units, but they're still helping to try to maintain the school resource officer. That's extremely important because they have to look at them in a different light than some of these negative um, uh, avenues that we're seeing uh, with some of the acts of violence involving law enforcement. Thank you, David. Uh, Rick, do you have anything to add to that? I think the one thing that, that we do and we encourage is that we need forums like this and others. Uh, law enforcement people, the, those in schools, really need to be educated on what to look for. There's so many new things out there. There's new uh, forms of communication out there that that uh, they may not be aware of where things are going on, threats to schools, things like that. Uh, and uh, we worked we worked on some videos, training videos with California Post and DHS, and and uh, we need more of that out there because it's it's an ever changing landscape, and uh, it, it's hard enough for us to keep up with it, much less the the school resources and uh, officers and, and others out there. Great, and Miriam, just wanna circle back to you. Anything else on this uh, collaboration between law enforcement and school districts uh, around sharing information about es escalating concerns with student behavior? Yeah, I, I really think that what therapists have done well is to kind of work with the family members, you know, because to, to really understand, you know, and, and I think that the, the school could do the same thing with the law enforcement because it really takes 
uh, like a whole society intervention to be efficient. And what we explain to family members is that the, the you know the parents from Parents for Peace, their children are dead. They're dead, you know, so it's better to work with the law enforcement as early as possible. At least there is a possibility for, you know, to help them, to re rehabilitate them rather than being dead or, 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 or harming other people in a sense. And usually family really gets on board because nobody wants to be in the first page of the newspaper. It, but it, it's, it's work. It's really a process. Thank you. So I'm going to shift a little away from schools um, and we have a question about law enforcement in general. Uh, what steps are being taken to ensure law enforcement are not a part of these groups? Um, and we got a second question about that referencing a recent IACP police magazine talking about extremism in the ranks. Uh, so I kind of want to throw this question to everyone on the panel. Um, maybe we can start Jeff with you and then uh, we'll go to Rick, Miriam and then David. I think it's it's really important. Um, in my experience, we had a lot of people when I was involved in this that were going into in and out of the military. <clears throat> By the time I had left the organization, pretty close to half or 40, 45 percent of the organization had served in the military at one point in time. Law enforcement, the numbers were quite a bit smaller, um, but there has been cases where law enforcement are involved in extremist organizations. So. I think it's incredibly important that we we bridge those gaps and, and we work on that because if you have extremists that are in positions of authority, I mean, it's just a, it's a, a trash can fire waiting to happen uh, as far as that goes. So we definitely, uh, any kind of uh, collaboration between the community, between police departments, between um, organizations like the Wiesenthal Center, Parents for Peace, Beyond Barriers, we've, we've all got to work together. And I'll, I'll second what Marian, uh, Miriam was saying as far as that goes, that it, it needs to be a whole community approach, absolutely. Thank you. Rick, any thoughts about uh, law enforcement and extremism in the ranks? Uh, just that, that law enforcement needs to be aware that they are a prime target. There's nothing that, that at least some of these extremist groups would like to do than recruit law enforcement, recruit, recruit military people. We've seen all too well uh, uh, in recent, recent months about the Oath Keepers uh, uh, and, you know, they're, they're doing it by targeting law enforcement and say, you need to enforce your oath. You need to uh, uh, um, help us in this way. And it's kind of kind of directing, putting it on, on them as uh, from their oath. So they're, they're definitely a target for extremism. Uh, although some groups would shy away from that, there, there are plenty who do not. And uh, as we've seen recently, law enforcement people have to be on their guard all the time. Uh, and really weigh uh, what they're what they're doing, and and even even just you know what they what they may post online because it, it's it's having uh, it's having uh, tragic consequences, and 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 it, it can also be hurting their careers as well. Thank you. Well, yeah, I'm glad about the question. So uh, a lot of people in law enforcement are veterans, and uh, you know we. Not too long ago, we uh, were invited to for a hearing to speak in Congress, literally because focus on the military and the grooming into extremism for really obvious reason. Uh, so what we have done uh, probably like a couple of years ago, I think uh, we have piloted uh, uh, um, a pro not a project, but uh, a program that we have developed with Chris Buckley. Uh, you know, my colleague Chris Buckley is a veteran and he's a former clan member. And so what we did is we developed, uh, you know, a program that we piloted at Aurora PD uh, in Colorado. And we wanted to design a program for returnees, but also for law, uh, law enforcement to address the, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the trauma that goes with the job. You know, so what we want is we don't want to kind of make the law enforcement or the military be the bad guys. We really want to address the wound, the PTSD, the stress, you know, uh, you know, that really kind of make people vulnerable to be recruited into extremism. It's way more powerful and effective, and we were very happy with the outcome, and actually we are looking forward to, uh, you know, pilot this, uh, uh, this uh, program again. Um, Thank you. David, anything to add on that conversation? 
Yeah, this isn't a new subject. Um, it, you know, the um, uh, the biker gangs were were very big in getting infiltration into law enforcement in the early years, uh, getting um, staffers to help them get information and, and those kind of things. So this is kind of just moving um, as things change. But one of the things the responsibilities are is for the chief executives uh, to be aware of things that they should be looking at. Um, to include, uh, we didn't have this you know, back in the early days in law enforcement, as somebody's mentioned, that um, social media, what they're posting, uh, what they're texting, all these kind of things, um, even the use of um, you know, body markings, tattoos, and so forth, um, notes that they have. Those are all things that chief executives and supervisors need to be aware of, and they have to be aware of from fellow officers because that information, if it's not passed on to the right places, that allegiance to someone else could be an officer safety issue. Thank you. Um, so another question, we got we got a couple of these, and then Jeff, uh, this is I think related to a comment you made in your presentation, is uh, if you can elaborate more about how prevalent the weapon of rape in hate crimes is. Um, so if you can kind of maybe address that. Yeah, that's really that's really a newer uh, trend. That that's something that uh, we hadn't seen a lot of um, in the past. I I can say, um, just from being in a, in the above ground uh, hate organization, it was important to protect the women and and look after them. <clears throat> Excuse me, and um, and women were were uh, looked after in that sense. So this this is it's particularly something that we're seeing coming out of like the accelerationist camps. Um, and, and the accelerationists are, you know, promoting violence a lot of times openly and um, this uh, targeting of women. It's, I wouldn't, wouldn't say it's brand new as far as the rape uh, aspect goes, but you have some mixing with the incels and mixing with some of these really extreme accelerationist types where they're saying this type of thing. And I can say, uh, looking back now, around the time that I was leaving the movement, I remember seeing some things online um, of, a, of a beaten woman saying, saying that she deserved it and things like that coming from uh, alt-right uh, camp, the alt-right camp as well. And I was very disturbed by that uh, because it just wasn't something that the old school white nationalist groups would have, uh, would have openly endorsed or improved, uh, approved of, excuse me. So it's it's definitely something to keep an eye on, but I think most of it's coming from your accelerationist camps and and maybe some aspects of the of the alt right, but uh, it does seem to be a worrying and increasing trend, especially with that uh, U.S. Marine that was just uh, arrested uh, yesterday. I think it was uh, uh, with the rape waffen situation. Yeah, Nazi, let me just yes, I, I put a there I, just to add. Um, as Jeff said, you know, kind of old school, and I hate to keep going back to that, but rape was the, uh, you know, primary weapon in dealing with street gangs and biker groups um, in a control method, but um, also these groups that were involved with or dealing with human trafficking. Um, that is uh, one of the tools that they use uh, as a control methodology, uh, not as much as a weapon per se, but more as a control methodology. Thank you. I'm going to try to get in one more question uh, to Miriam and then I will hand it off because I recognize we're running out of time. We didn't get to all the questions. Um, but Miriam, are there radicalization screeners available for juvenile probation officers, guidance counselors, therapists, et cetera, that are working with at risk youth on a daily basis? So I would love, I wish it, uh, it were, you know, so I've been actually trying to reach out, I think of this issue as a public health issue. And what I wish for us, uh, you know, in the country is that someday we could have a screening that actually starts at the pediatric office, the same way that we're screening, screening for autism. You know, there was a time when there was no screening about that, you know, and I wish if they were, you know, and I'm really hoping that the public health uh, uh, world really steps, it steps in. You know, unfortunately, this problem is too much into the law enforcement and politicized. And I would like to, you know, I would like to the public health world to step in, you know, uh, uh, and I think that we will see uh, a big difference. Unfortunately, there is not. 
Thank you. Um, and again, I just want to thank all the panelists. I also want to thank all of the participants. Uh, sorry that we didn't get through all the questions, but I'm sure William will provide some contact information uh, so that you can get your uh, any kind of remaining questions you may have. So with that, it has been an honor to be with you uh, this afternoon. Thank you for your service and William, I'll hand it back to you. All right, thank you very much, Nasmia, and uh, thank you again to all of the panelists uh, for some great information that you all provided today. Uh, just as a quick reminder to those before you exit, if you could, please go over to your control panel on uh, the side of your screen there, click on that polling and please take a moment to answer the polls if you haven't done so already. We would really appreciate uh, your feedback uh, providing uh, uh, answer to the polls. Um, Please note that we are, uh, we have also located in the chat the Google Drive, Google Drive that you can click on and get access to a PDF of this presentation that has the links to all of the resources that you've seen provided, including accessing the OJJDP Model Program Guide Literature Review on Hate Crimes and Youth uh, with a plethora of um, links and URLs that you can click on and that you can easily get access to all of the resources. Reminder to everyone that you will receive in a, uh, a certificate of attendance automatically uh, via the uh, WebEx automated email. And so please be on the lookout for that certificate. You should receive it shortly. Uh, please note that if you'd like to get in contact with OJJDP's Intech, you can do so by, by contacting us here at this URL. We also encourage you to please sign up for the listserv uh, that we have so you can keep up to date with upcoming events that we have. Um, also note that if you would like to get in contact with the TTA Health Desk the Juve Just, or learn more about Juve Just or even upcoming events that we have, you can do so through all of the URLs that are located located on this slide. We encourage folks to please connect with OJJDP through all of the um, uh, virtual platforms that you see here, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Also, again, you can sign up for the newsletter. And as I mentioned in the slide before, please sign up for the OJJDP Juve just as well. Do you have a training or technical assistance need? Well, if so, we do encourage you to please uh, submit your request via the TTA 360 platform. Uh, this will be a way that we can get you connected to a provider that can help you with your training and technical assistance need. As I mentioned on the top of the hour, and I'll mention again to folks who um, we're asking uh, during the presentation, please note that this webinar, in addition to other webinars, are located on OJJDP's multimedia page. Also note that it's located on OJJDP's YouTube channel as well. And you can also see on OJJDP's multimedia page where we have a page that, uh, dedicated specifically to preventing youth hate crimes. And so please go to that page and uh, review past webinars that we've had. Uh, don't forget to contact the TTA help desk if you would like to get access to supporting materials and also transcript. Uh, please note that the opinions, findings, and conclusions or recommendations expressed in this program are those of the author or authors in this case and do not necessarily reflect those of the United States Department of Justice. Uh, and then finally, last but certainly not least, we have a few more webinars in our Preventing Youth Hate Crime series coming up soon. Uh, please note that we want you all to join us for a webinar on the 19th and one on the 30th. Both of these will uh, focus on combating digital hate and also enhancing uh, investigator skills and uh, techniques and backgrounds on working on work cases that focus specifically on criminal extremist hate groups. Uh, but these webinars are for law enforcement personnel only. So please note that these webinars will only be for law enforcement personnel. With that being said, I want to thank again everyone for coming out today. Thank you so much for your time. Have a wonderful afternoon and bye-bye for now. Thanks for joining.